Welcome back uh, for this next episode on the great spiritual master, Blessed Thomas Akempis. Father Nixon, thank you for being here again. Thank you, Connor. Our first episode, we did a, a really in-depth <laughs> biographical overview of his life and his works and his time, and that was fascinating. And it's it's impossible to talk about Thomas Akempis without talking about imitation of Christ. So we're going to do that today. Um just so the audience knows what we're doing, but can you begin with uh, a brief prayer to kind of put us in the right spiritual framework to talk about this great work? O oh Lord, we implore your grace and your wisdom. May our hearts be open to the wisdom of Thomas Akempis. May we strive to imitate our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May we walk in his footsteps, follow him through suffering through death, and by your grace, follow him also to eternal glory. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Imitation of Christ, the second best-selling book of all time. In countless translations, countless editions, we ourselves at TAN, we got three uh, editions of this book, and you know, actually probably more than that, because uh, we have other sets. Uh, so actually, I think we have four editions of this work. Wow, well, wow. Well. Not to mention audiobook and ebook. But um, so I guess the the best opening question is why? What is so important about this book? Why has it sold more copies than anything in the history of the world, other than the Bible? Yeah, people absolutely uh, love this book. And it exists in, in innumerable editions. I mean, back in the 19th century, they said there were over 3,000 editions of the work in existence. And, and today, I, I, I don't think anyone could count how many there are. Um, why this work is so accessible is because it speaks directly to the heart. It's a work which, is, um, which in some ways is, is easy to read. It's not, it's not an enormous volume, um, but you can read one page of it or two pages of it or one chapter of it or however much and take this with you. So it's a, such a rich field of uh, thought for meditation. And, you know, I think reading The Imitation of Christ is a little bit like reading 10 or 20 other books mm. Mm. because it stays with you. And this is the experience of a lot of people. I know I myself certainly read this book uh, when I was a very young child, I found a copy of it on uh, on my dad's bookshelf, I think, and uh, you know I was keen to read it, and it's 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 remained with me ever since. Yeah, <clears throat> so I think um, when I read it, it's something that I can kind of maybe this isn't the best thing to do, but I can pick it up and and read kind of any sentence throughout the book. You can just kind of dip in anywhere, and. You know, I I don't feel lost. You know, a lot of other books you might feel lost. Yeah. Um, but you can kind of dip in at any point in this. It seems like it's a whole lot of one-off beautiful sentences and you know insights that you can meditate on. So it's almost a book that you do lexio divina with. You know, it's sort yeah. of like you read it and meditate, read it, and meditate. You don't just pick it up and in, read it straight no, through. No, no, no. It, it is indeed. So every chapter is self-contained, and each chapter. Um, most of the chapters are fairly short, um, are divided into a number of different points, and, and each of these points is material for meditation. So I think it, this is an ideal book for uh, almost opening at random and reading a paragraph, and, and it gives you each time something very rich to reflect upon. So I'm, I'm, I'm just going to mention the different editions that we have, and not to I'm not trying to hawk our books. That's not my point. But we have to, to kind of show you the, the versatility of the use of the books, right? So we have this book here by Tan, which is just part of our Catholic classics. It's a typical paper-bound book, beautifully laid out, um, kind of a typical book that you'd find on your, on your bookshelf. Then we also have a very high-end leather edition that has a zipper has a like nice little zipper le leather and you know this is this is like the ultimate gift you know and and people put prayer cards and things inside the zipper yeah. so it's a very kind of high end because this this book is worthy of being a gift this this looks like a sacred text now that you can take into the chapel with it you does, you know it does. but then you also have and this is actually my favorite version 
it's called My Imitation of Christ. And this was a, a little a little company that we acquired a number of years ago called the Confraternity of the Precious Blood. And they published these, these little these little books like this. And this one, this edition, it just fits right in your pocket and you carry it around. So when I go to mass, you know, I usually I very often will take this because you can just fit it right yeah. in your pocket. And also in the back, it has an extensive index and like a table of contents that shows you whatever you're struggling with, there's a reference to it in the book. Like yeah. you can look up your problem and then it'll take you right to a, a certain part in the book. And it also has these kind of very famous illustrations of this guy who's like wearing a suit and tie. He's like a business executive and he's wearing a suit and tie and he's carrying his cross. You know, these, these were this this volume was very, very popular back in the day because of these illustrations showing you know, the idea here was we're showing not just not just like old masters artwork, but but we're showing how a guy who is out in the world is supposed to be imitating Christ. So it's an interesting it's an interesting volume. And, you know, I, I love this particular volume. I love it. My point is, is the imitation of Christ. It's applicable for all walks of life, whether you're a stay at home mom with little kids whether you're that business executive or you're a monk in uh you know in a in a yeah. monastery in the middle of Australia. <laughs> yes it is. It, it it speaks to every every catholic and um you know it's it's such a classic. Everyone should have a copy of this book um on their bookshelf or or by their bed, you know, and make a habit of reading it. Read, you know, a chapter a day. It takes not very long, 5 or 10 minutes. Yeah. If that. And I love the uh, portable edition, which you can slip into your pocket and, yeah. and have with you forever, spare moments and so forth. That's the thing is, again, like I, you know, at mass, I'm not going to be able to read a big chunk of it, but just one or two lines out of this book are, are worthy of meditation. That's that's yeah. the beauty of it. One thing I was going to mention is, you know, let's talk, we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, this in the, in the previous episode about the time in which this book came out, right? Yeah. So we talked about a little bit more from his biographical, you know, information, his that that standpoint. But this book came at an interesting point in history, right? So there had been this revival, and people were really trying to return to, you know, uh, the concepts of mortification and interior life, and not just the rules and regulations of the church, and not just theology. So maybe you can mention that again, as we talked about in the last episode, but how. The, this particular work, Imitation of Christ, and its sentiments and its topics and its flavor and its style really, you know, came out of that time period on purpose. It, it fits that time period as part of that revival in the church. Yeah, very much so. So it, he really focuses very strongly on the interior life. And the uh, the second the, – the book is divided into four separate main sections, which are called books – the second section on on interior things or on interior realities um, speaks about you know the, this whole interior life, and this is so important that our religion doesn't just consist of external observances and everything, um, which were probably much bigger in his time than what they are now, um, but rather this internal conversion, this internal conformity to the model which Christ presents us, uh, looking at the virtues of humility, the love of solitude, at detachment. These things are so important, and Thomas brings these very much to the fore. So because this internal life is something which is more or less unchanging from one generation to the next, this book continues to uh, to speak to people so powerfully. Yeah, so, you know, that... that uh there, there's a there's a great passage, and I was trying to find it, and I just can't find it, but I remember it so vividly. It's rather early in the book. I was probably in the book one. But he says, whenever I go out amongst men, I return home yeah, less of one. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> and, you know the passage. Yes, then, I yeah. do. I did. And, and that, in fact, is is a quote from the Roman philosopher Seneca. Oh, okay. So, yeah. so Kemp um, stole it from him. And, and he, he really emphasizes the importance of um, – of solitude and of the dangers of keeping keeping company. Now, we shouldn't interpret this as meaning, no, you should be a complete loader and avoid people at all costs, but rather the, the fact that we need to moderate these things um, and to preserve solitude. 
And Thomas Akempis is a great, uh, one of the reasons that he appeals so strongly is he uh, encourages a very moderate approach. So it's not a kind of excessive um, aestheticism or uh, refusal to deal with the world, but it's keeping it in balance, keeping it in the right perspective, you know, and to recognize the dangers of of being uh, in company that, that, yeah, I think most people can experience that, that you you sometimes are in, in company in a situation and you, you do something or say something or, or witness something which you normally wouldn't want to be associated with at all. Yeah. And uh, it's particularly for young people, of course. Um, so, yes, this, this cultivation of solitude, yeah. I tell you what, like, even as a dad of a bunch of little kids, my kids are great. But I'm telling you what, they go spend that at a friend's house. They go to their grandparents' house and get spoiled. Yep. They come back 24 hours later and they're resistant to doing their chores and everything. I mean, it's like they come back. I have to reprogram them just even after one night away. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a little little child version of, yeah, when we go out in the world, yep. we come back all, all messed up. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know. All right. So um, – did this book, do you know, did this book become like an immediate success? Did it take a long time? Yeah, it, well, it actually did more or less become an immediate success. So um, he wrote this, I guess, in the early 1400s mm -hmm. and um, or towards the middle of the 1400s. And it did. It became widely circulated. But the thing is, he didn't put his name to it as the author. So the early editions of it, some are anonymous. Some list a certain Benedictine, John Gerson, as the author. Really? Um, was that yeah. a pen name? Like no, no, that was an actual. It was an actual was person, an actual guy, very I prominent see. spiritual writer. Oh, okay. Um, a blessed, in fact. So he was often given as the author, um, and then Thomas Akempis as well. So there was a long. In fact, um, I've read that there are more than 200 people who have been named as possible authors wow. of The Imitation of Christ, wow. including people like St. Bernard of Clairvaux, which is really way off the nah, mark. No, that's 400 it's, years It's, it's not possible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but even in the Roman breviary today, when they have readings from The Imitation of Christ, it says it just says, from The Imitation of Christ. It mm. doesn't say by Thomas wow. Kempis. Wow. But scholars today believe very confident that he did, in fact, write it. And they can tell this by by the manuscript copies that are in existence and where they are and when they date from. So it, yeah. it, it clearly is his own work. And if you read his other works, there is uh, such a, a similarity of style and themes and so Well, forth. just mention again the humility. Like, it's probably not – it's not a coincidence that yeah. he wrote this book, but he kind of stayed anonymous. I mean, talk about how that is actually very yeah, yeah. reflective in his own – Writings. Yeah, so he he was an author who um, who actually sought to remain anonymous, and this was actually as part of the monastic tradition to write things and to to um, to not sign your name to them. Yeah, some of the best handbooks are actually by a monk of this abbey. It just says that it doesn't even say the name. You know, I've yep. noticed that a lot. These old works. Yeah, it's, yep, it's, yep, it's yep, kind of yep, common. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Um, so. This was part of the tradition that he was writing it, but it did become fairly well known during his life that he wrote it because people flocked to him to receive, to listen to him speaking and also to receive his private spiritual counsel. So, yeah, it's separated into four books um, uh, or four parts. And, you know, one of the interesting things, I think it's in book three, he, he takes a, a, a slightly different tactic and he starts having uh, – it's kind of separated into two things. You have the disciple who speaks to Christ and then he has Christ speak to the disciple. Yeah. And it's a, it's a good tactic as a writer. You know, there's – I guess it's a little risky business to kind of imagine that you can create the words of Christ. But he was on solid ground. He knew what he was doing. But when you read it, I think I – think, and in fact, in today's world, Father, there's a lot of very famous texts out there, um, especially even in the Protestant world, where they have take this, this tactic of words imagining what Christ would say to us in our circumstance. Yeah. And it's very soothing. It's very consoling to have words of Christ that are not in the Gospels, right? But it's just him yeah, talking yeah. to us. But that's become a popular thing today. A Kempis was doing it in 1400. So, you know, I, yeah. I find it extremely therapeutic, I guess is the yeah, word, or yeah, comforting yeah. to have, to see the words of Christ 
that are not from scripture, but relate very much to my everyday life. And I, I just, I think he was an, one of the early people to, to do you that. You know, I, I, I think you're right, Connor. I'm just thinking uh, we do have other dialogues where words are sometimes put into the mouth of other people, but but not into the words of, into the mouth of Christ himself. Yeah. Now, when I say uh, this is the words he gives to Christ are, are really fuller explanations of what we find in the gospel. Hmm. Um, so he's not like making up his own thing and, sure. and Christ says this. <coughs> and, of course, we know what we have in the gospel is the essence of what Christ said. But, of course, he said much, much more than than what the uh, gospels record for yeah. us. Yeah, definitely. Part four of the, the book is on the Blessed Sacrament. And I find that, you know, a, a, little, a little interesting um, because I don't exactly, I mean, I know that the church has always believed in the true presence of the Eucharist, yeah. but, but I think that was, a it was something that was, um, maybe a little unique at the time. At the to, time. Yeah. yeah, it was, it was. And in fact, um, the imitation of Christ in a lot of the, uh, Protestant editions of it omit this fourth book on the real presence of, of God in the blessed sacrament. Um, in fact, it had become a topic during the time of Thomas Akempis because, as, as we spoke about before, this was a time when Protestant thought was starting to emerge. Mm -hmm. And I think he was very keen to correct some of these new streams of thought that people were speculating, is the Eucharist just a symbol and so forth? Right. So he very emphatically uh, uh, affirms the true presence. Yeah, so if you love the Eucharist and you like devotional uh, works on the Eucharist, I mean, I think the imitation of Christ is one of the originals. And to, to go back and, I mean, you can... You can even go just straight to part four and start, you know, reading that in your meditations, particularly yeah, in adoration. You, you can. In fact, four kind of stands alone. It seems scholars believe that part four was written kind of as an independent work oh, and really? then appended later, oh, okay. uh, added added to the uh, to the. Yeah, that's environment. awesome. Yeah. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe we'll publish it as a separate work to kind of just because because again it's like a book and if you have or if you're working through it a lot of times you don't get to it you know because you fall off the wagon you know halfway through the book and oh, never yeah. get to it so yeah. i might i might think about taking that and publishing that as a separate book so that you get to you the, get the, to the, it that's you know? a, that's a very good idea yeah and interestingly you mentioned you know if you have the practice of opening the book and reading it at random yeah unfortunately i don't know if Myself, I find I tend to open either at the beginning or the middle, right. not so much at, at the, the end. end right. So I think there are probably a lot of people who, who've who never actually made it through book yeah. four. Yeah. So, you know, the influence of this book is – it's remarkable. It's sort of, it's sort of like, um, you know, <laughs> in our culture here – I mean, this is a silly thing in America, but we have this thing called the Kevin Bacon game, right? And so he's a famous actor and yeah. kind of every – Every actor uh, throughout all of movie history can be connected back to Kevin Bacon okay. in like five or six steps, you know, because he's just in so many movies with so many other influential. Right. Yeah, yeah, so right. you can kind of – so people play this silly game. My point, that's kind of a – maybe an, a very unrefined <laughs> way to dis describe the imitation of Christ, but – you can take like all the other great works after the imitation of Christ and in one or two or three steps, you can, you know, connect it back to it. So, you know, Introduction to Devout Life by by St. Francis de Sales, one of my yeah, favorite, yeah, yeah. you know, he says that this was one of the books that influenced him more than any, el in, any in, other indeed, book. Indeed, indeed, indeed. So this was really one of the very first like spiritual handbooks mm. for Catholics. Which was not. I mean, there were there were books, but they were written either specifically for monks or nuns or priests. This is one which is universal. So it kind of provides the original paradigm of this type of spiritual writing, which other writers have taken up uh, as well over the course of the centuries. But this is the original and the classic. Yeah. So the inf the the big saints that you know that I've found right away. Just a quick research is Thomas More. You know, he yeah. was heavily influenced by this book. And I don't know if he had this – something in my mind saying that he may have had this book when he was in prison. You know, it was like his – the book that he meditated with oh, while yes, in prison, yes, which is yes. amazing. But what's interesting is 
Um, also Ignatius of Loyola, right? Who founded the Jesuits. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I mean yes, he, he loved this work. Yeah, he loved this work. Um, and then, uh, of, oh, of, of course, um, Therese of Lisieux. You know, she yeah. talks about in the story of a soul how this was essentially her favorite book. Yeah, you know? yeah. So you, you're influencing every, you know, Thomas More, Ignatius of Loyola, St. Francis de Sales, and Therese of Lisieux, right? I mean, these are very different saints. Indeed, you know, indeed, they're, they're, indeed. it covers everybody. You indeed, know? indeed. So this is this is a book which has has shaped the church. It, it's in fact it's shaped history. You yeah. know, because there's also a lot of you know politicians, public leaders, and so forth throughout history who have deeply loved and revered this work. Yeah. Well, uh, in our in our next uh, episode, we're going to be talking about the hum. Uh, his other work, humility and the ele uh, elevation of the mind to God. But any last thoughts for our listeners on this great work, Imitation of Christ, second best-selling book of all time? <laughs> yes, Connor. Um, I'd say if you don't have a copy, get one. <laughs> <laughs> and um, if you haven't read it for a while, revisit it. I mean, there's people who've read it when they were young and then maybe um, haven't has it, haven't visited it again. Read it, and uh, particularly book four, you know, it's a, it's a great treasure there, which is often overlooked. Yeah. Well, thank you, and we'll, uh, we'll be talking to you uh, very soon. Thanks, Connor.